welcome, Christine E. Schultz here, your favorite Elvish author, and welcome back to another chapter reaction, where I read the first chapters of books to help you guys discover something new that you might want to read, and also to help myself discover new things that I want to read as well. And today, we're going to be diving into a book called Cursed by Lish McBride. Now, this is one of the books that in an earlier video I picked up, uh, well, really my boyfriend picked up on a library book haul. And for those of you who watched that video, you might remember that this book uh, seems to be like a gender bent version of Beauty and the Beast, where the girl is the beast and the boy ends up being the hero that's going to set her free from the curse. So we're just going to dive right in, strap on your elf ears, and let's check out Curses. The blurb to Curses says, a run-in with a fairy godling at her betrothal ball left Merrick Craven with more than any fairy-born noble could want. Wealth, intelligence, and the kind of beastly visage that makes children weep. Now, Merrick has until her 18th birthday to break the fairy's curse. And every day, she loses a little bit more of herself to the animal she's become. All because she picked one unsuitable boy. Tevin Dumont has nothing except a fairy gift of charm, an exceptionally handsome face and two siblings he's trying desperately to protect. As the oldest son in a family of con artists, he's learned how to use what he has to his best advantage. He'll do anything to keep his siblings safe. So, when his mother runs afoul of the Beast of Craven, Tevin doesn't think twice. He'll pay his mother's debt, even if it means taking her place. With her birthday looming, Merritt has to find a match, but she's terrified she'll make the same mistake as before. Then she meets Tevin and realizes there's no one better to protect her from an unsuitable match than the most unsuitable boy of all. Can Tevin help her break the curse? Or is she doomed to be the Beast of Craven forever? So yeah, definitely a little gender bent Beauty and the Beast going on. Um, all because she picked one unsuitable boy. I can relate to that. I have a history of, well, I have picked some really good guys, but I've also picked a couple of just really the absolutely wrong choices before uh, discovering, you know, being led to my current boyfriend who is the absolute best thing to ever exist for me. Uh, so yeah, shout out to him. He'll be on some future videos with us back again. But today you just have me reading Curses by Alicia McBride. Let's go ahead and dive into chapter one. Oh boy. So for those of you who like this kind of thing, there is a cast of characters at the beginning of this book. And it tells you who's human born, if they're gifted, if they're cursed, if they're fairy born. So that's pretty cool. Those things can be pretty fun um, and also help you to kind of keep characters straight as well. So yeah, at the beginning, even before the prologue, let's go ahead and read this because I think this part could be important. It says, a fairy curse is a cruel twist of fate bestowed on someone by a fairy godling, sometimes deserved and sometimes not, but generally unwanted and not well thought out. And a fairy gift, is the same as a fairy curse, really. Only the fairy in question thinks this one is a really good idea. So it sounds like a gift isn't really much better than a curse. Uh, the difference is just that, you know, the fairy actually thinks that it's a really good idea. Maybe it's not. It is the opinion of the author that both should be avoided, if at all possible. And this is an excerpt from Musings, a personal look into the fairy kissed and cursed, author anonymous, for reasons. I, for one, would never put my health and safety in the inexpert hands of Matt Magecraft. Humans may be enamored with their shiny playthings, but we are more enlightened beings know that nothing will ever replace the majesty and stately conveyance that is the horse and carriage. And that is from a letter to the editor of the Pierre Dan Gazette in response to the opening of the new train lines in the spring of 1880. All right, so now we're gonna jump into the beginning of the story. This one starts off with a prologue, which whenever my boyfriend gets around to reading this, will make him super happy. If you've watched any of our videos together, you know that he just really loves prologues. Uh, so yeah, the prologue takes place in the house of Craven Country Seat, 1883. Merritt Craven, only heir to the barony of Craven and current absentee from her own betrothal ball, locked herself in her room, then pushed the dresser in front of the door, just in case. The dresser was heavy, and pushing it left her dress askew, and her carefully curled and pinned up to a tangled mess by the time she was done. You come out this instant, young lady! 
Lady Zarla punctuated her demand with a moment of consistent but quiet fuzz on the stout wooden door. No, mother. Merritt started yanking out the hairpins one by one, massaging her scalp. Her hair had a natural wave to it, but the maid had spent so much time heating and curling it that she no longer recognized the texture. Stop being such a child. Her mother's voice through the door was fierce but low, because fairy-born aristocracy wouldn't be so uncouth as to yell. You stop being such a child. As a retort, it lacked flair, and in many ways only supported her mother's argument. Merritt hadn't considered herself to be a child for several years. As the only heir, she had had to pack up her childhood early and assume certain responsibilities. And yet, at this exact moment, that was exactly how she felt. Small. Young. Scared. I told you to cancel it! Her words were calm, but the pins in her fist shook. She didn't love him, though that puny fact would not signify with her mother. He's old enough to be my father! If her betrothed were a few years older, he'd be old enough to be Lady Zarla's father. He said he'd wait until you were 18. Honestly, Merritt, very born gentlemen of his ilk don't grow on trees. He can wait forever, Merritt yelled, throwing her pins at the door. Her mother gasped at the slip in Merritt's decorum, and Merritt did not care. No, she did not. And if she kept saying she didn't care, eventually it would be true, wouldn't it? Godling Verity, we are graced with your presence. Lady Zarla's voice had completely altered, her tone now reverent and careful. Merritt put a hand over her mouth, muffling the sound that wanted to come out. In the mess of things, she had completely forgotten. Her mother had hired a fairy godling to gift the union. Godling Verity was temperamental, even for her kind. Any perceived slight would be blown entirely out of proportion. Merritt slid down the wall, pulled her knees up to her chest, and wrapped her arms around them. Is there a problem? The godling's words held a crisp bite of authority. Merritt didn't think anyone had argued with Godling Verity in her entire life. No sane person would. Lady Merritt is indisposed. Even through the door, Merritt could tell that Lady Zarla was holding on to her composure by her fingernails. She'll be back out in a moment. Fear spiked through Merritt, but so did determination. She had already chosen the boy she would marry, and he was most certainly not the paunchy, gray-haired baron waiting for her in the ballroom. I won't, Merritt yelled without thinking. I'm not coming out. It was the last straw. Her mother smacked the door with her hand. You want to wait for your fortune hunter, you beastly girl? Want him to come back and profess his love? Well, he's not coming. Not tonight. Not ever. You will grow up and do as I say. Merit! She banged on the door some more. Get out here right this minute. Merit's fingers slid over the beautiful beating of her skirt. She had been so excited about this dress when she had first seen the sketch. The exquisite detail, the sweetheart neckline, the deep purple of the fabric. It was the kind of dress her mother would wear. The dress of a woman, not a girl. Months ago, before she'd actually met her betrothed and the reality had set in, before she had fallen for Jasper, she had touched the swatch of fabric the dressmaker had brought and looked forward to this moment, as if donning the dress would wave a magic wand, making her into a sure and steady adult. Now the hem was torn, the beating ruined. He will come back for me. Merritt was no longer sure if she was trying to convince her mother or herself. A beat of silence then, a hesitation that told her that her mother was struggling with herself. Fine. Wonderful. If he comes back for you, for you, not your money or your title, you're welcome to him. You'll have my blessings. But he won't come back, Merritt. Her capitulation surprised Merritt. It was too easy. How are you so sure? You don't even know him. Because I made him an offer, and he took it. Took the coin and ran. He wanted your family's money. Not you. Merritt choked back a sob. The dull blade of betrayal sliced through her. Her mother was wrong. She had to be. Jasper loved her. He loved her. He promised. Lady Zarla smacked the door again. Merritt, you are the heir to one of the oldest and most respected baronies in this land, and you will act like it. Now, come out here before the guests start talking. Merritt's entire body trembled, but she made no move to open the door. Her mother was lying. She had to be. He would never. Only, it didn't sound like her mother was lying, did it? Merritt heard a new sound then, the faint buzzing of wings. Her pulse sped up. You refuse to honor your mother's choice. Godling Verity crooned oddly, as though she was pleased by Merritt's dis disobedience. Merritt swallowed her fear, her doubt. Even if her mother was right, she couldn't marry her betrothed. The thought of his hands on her made her want to curl up and die. I refuse. 
The words rasped out of her throat, but the godling heard. There was no doubt about that. Something tapped against the door. Merritt would realize later it was Godling Verity's wand. Beastly girl is right. You will get your gift from me this night. The hum of wings grew louder. As you are still young, I will be generous and give you a chance to learn from your folly. Merritt could almost see the cold smile on her face. If love appears, we will bow to your will. If not, it will be as your mother says. You will marry someone of her choosing by your 18th birthday. Merritt placed her hands flat on the floor, trying to quiet the trembling of her body. It didn't stop the fierce slicing of her spine. For a second, she wavered. But then she thought again of her betrothed, of his greedy eyes on her, his clammy hands when he grasped her fingers and planted a dry kiss on her knuckles. If I don't, then you will become a beast in truth. Do you still refuse? Merritt closed her eyes. Yes. There was a flash, then a whoosh, and Merritt felt like her world tipped sideways and split in half. She didn't remember anything else until one of her mother's footmen removed the door at its hinges. When she opened her eyes, it was to see the footman faint dead away, the heavy door in his hands clattering to the floor. Then, her mother screamed. Chapter One, A Thief in the Garden. Florencia Dumont spit on the ground and cursed. There is a chance. From the rolling cadence of her accent, the weather mage was Ivanian, though that wasn't such a leap of logic. Most weather mages were. The woman touched her shoulder, a quick press of warmth as her fellow mages looked on in sympathy. Or pity. Did it matter? There is always a chance. Seek the harbor master. Surely they can aid you. My goods were not insured, Florentia said smoothly. She looked down, feigning shame, letting the mage think she was either too poor to pay the dues or too foolish. Both reasons graded, but both were legal. Her cargo was not. Oh, she could petition on behalf of her legitimate goods, but they were cheap baubles and not worth the time and paperwork. Florencia kicked mud off her boots. The salty tang of the breeze off the ocean usually invigorated her. The swarm of humanity on the pier was colorful, bright, and a feast to the eyes, as well as to the pockets of your fingers were deft enough or your tail convincing. But not today. Today she smelled only salt and dead fish. Everyone's ship had come in. Hers had not. Squalls from the northeast hit the Tirada coast hard, the mage said. There was nothing to be done. The blue swirl of tattoos on her cheeks, temples, and neck eddied like the wind across her brown skin. Since mages only got tattoos when they reached master status, Florencia had to accept that the harbor mage knew what she was talking about, even if she didn't like the news herself. Her goods were at the bottom of the sea with the fish, and it was impossible to swindle fish. Florencia thanked the mage, hiding her irritation as she handed over a few small coppers for her to share with the mages behind her. She would get another ship. It never occurred to her to doubt it. Florencia left the docks, absently dodging people in crates of something with wings that hissed as she walked by. Normally, she would have taken a peek. Who was stupid enough to trade in creatures from the enchanted forest? But her mind was already moving three steps ahead, creating and discarding plans to correct her fortunes. Florencia fetched her wagon. There would be no staying at an inn tonight. Without the ships, they would need the money to keep their creditors at bay. She could sell the wagon, fattening her purse as best she could. Florencia would keep her horse. It was important to protect the image of wealth. No one would do business with a beggar. This was only a momentary upset in their fortunes. They would be back up on top again. Florencia collected her horse, heading to a nearby inn. The closest one would have a place where she could sit, order a drink, and find a patsy to sell her wagon to. The Salty Siren was a bare-bones establishment. It wasn't the kind of place one actually wanted to rent a room from, unless a body loved the company of fleas. The dining room, however, was passably clean. The mediocre ale watered down but cheap, and the clientele diverse. Rich patrons didn't sleep here, but they did come here for business. It was the best place to hire a crew for your ship, or to unload your cargo. Florencia didn't bother cleaning her boots. The boot brush was already stiff with mud, so any effort would have been in vain. She sauntered in, her shoulders back, the tilt of her chin regal. People saw what you showed them, and Florencia Dumont had the look of a vengeful goddess made mortal. The haze of cigar smoke was thin. The windows opened to catch a late spring breeze. She had to alter her course quickly to avoid kicking over a brimming spittoon wet resting on the floor next to the bar. With a sneer, she decided that her earlier assessment of passably clean had been overly generous. Florencia traded two much needed coppers for a pint that she wouldn't give to a pig and took a seat at a small round table in the back of the dining room. Now, she simply had to wait. Like any good swindler, Florencia Dumont knew her assets well and traded on them heavily. She knew eyes had followed her confident swagger throughout the room. Tight breeches, expensive boots, and a face wroth with temptation guaranteed it. 
The salty siren was full of hungry patrons, and she was a four-course meal. She sipped and waited and dangled his bait. If she made it to the halfway point of her pint, she would undo her braids. She usually didn't have to. Florencia was an exceedingly handsome woman, but sometimes people needed a push, and her chestnut locks would do the trick. She was nowhere near halfway when someone took the seat across from her. Florencia gave her a passing glance, her eyes automatically assessing and cataloging the woman's worth. Her clothes were shabby, her floppy hat dipping low to obscure blonde hair that was almost white, and lips that made a dainty bow. An artful smudge of dirt stroked one cheekbone. This woman wanted to appear down on her luck, low-born, and working class, but the contents didn't match the wrapping. Her skin was porcelain pale, fingernails shaped and clean. Florencia had a hunch, but she needed a little bit more information, so she stuck her hand out. Florencia, she said, adopting a local accent she frequently heard around the docks. The woman took her hand, giving it an awkward shake. Delilah. Though she kept her face benignly friendly, inside, Florencia felt a flush of triumph. Delilah, which most certainly was not her name, had soft hands. No calluses meant no labor, and the awkward shake implied that she wasn't used to that greeting. Between that and her upper crust accent, Florencia figured that Delilah was the kind of person more used to dropping a curtsy than clasping palms. No, Delilah was very born, playing at human. For a moment, she considered whether Delilah was a godling in disguise, a favorite trick for the capricious creatures, used to catch mortals up so they could bestow their magic upon them. But no, Florencia thought not. When godlings disguise themselves, they use glamour magic to blend, making themselves look human. Away went the tipped ears, the wings, the pearlescent sheen to skin that could be anything from faintly green to blue-black. There was variation on the theme, like any other creatures, depending on the ancestry. The mistake most people made was to trust their eyes, but Florencia knew the secret. Godlings had a way about them, an air of haughty otherness that was hard to explain, but easy for her to identify. She had made it her mission early in life to learn what she could about them and their fairy-born descendants. Not all of them had deep pockets, but there were other things they could offer, and Florencia had get three gifted children to prove it. The fairy race didn't produce a lot of children, and over the years they had intermingled with humans to the point that they were hopelessly enmeshed, producing fairy-born like Delilah. Oh, Florencia couldn't see any hint of her lineage. The hat covered her ears, the skin could be obscured, and very few of the born had wings anymore. But Florencia had spent a lot of her life fleecing those with money or power, and the fairy born often have both. She was willing to bet her boots that Delilah was one of them, which meant Florencia's luck had turned. Delilah, you look like the last down on your luck, Florencia said, a hint of sympathy honeying her guileless tone. Care for a drink and a sympathetic ear? Florencia didn't wait for Delilah to respond before waving at the bar bar lad for a pint of ale. You are too kind. Delilah clasped her hands demurely in her lap. Am I so transparent? Florencia pulled out two more coppers to trade for the horse piss they called ale and smiled. Only to someone who has been in the same predicament. The bar lad took the coppers and handed Delilah her glass with a wink and a friendly smile before scurrying off to the next table. I'm afraid I've hit a spot of trouble, Delilah said, her elegant hands fluttering in the air like doves. She was a lovely creature, Florencia thought, and smart enough not to touch her ale. And, oh, I know it's not your problem, but I need a friendly face. Florencia buried a snort. Her face was many things, but friendly wasn't on the list. She had the feeling Delilah, or someone in her employ, had witnessed Florencia's problems at the dock. Delilah didn't need a friendly face. She needed a desperate soul. Ah, lass, your words land on sympathetic ears, she said, patting the younger woman's hand. I, too, have had a spot of troubles. I came all this way, only to leave with empty pockets and an empty cart. Delilah gasped in dismay, one of those dove-like hands coming to roost on her chest. The motions were perfect, but her eyes gave her away. This was not news to Delilah. I'm so sorry, she said. Florencia shrugged. The sea is a fickle mistress. She gives and takes, and we love her still, more fools we. For a second, Florencia thought she might be laying the folksy sailor routine on a little heavy, but the woman either didn't notice or didn't care. Delilah tutted, all concern, then leaned back, her face lighting up as if a sudden idea had occurred to her. Florencia wanted to applaud. Someone had given this woman a playbook and she was following it to the letter. Now she would lean in, clasp Florencia's hand to establish contact and trust, and then offer a proposal that would help them both. Delilah rested her soft hand on Florencia's, but the eyes shadowed by her hat were intent. You have a fast horse and know this land well? I do, Florencia supplied, and once I sell my cart, I'll move faster. Oh, this is wonderful. And not your misery, she was quick to add, but that we may help each other. Delilah spun a tale of dastardly traitor 
who took a deposit but didn't deliver the goods. There is a manor close to here, scarcely over the border. A few hours' ride on a good mount and a quick hop on the train, and you'd be there by nightfall. All I would need is a cutting of a plant. A single flower. She held her hands out as if to say, This is so simple, you should be paying me for the opportunity. Why can't you get the cutting yourself? Florencia asked. Delilah looked forlornly into her ale. There is a mix-up with my travel papers. So tedious, but one can't cross the border of Huldre without them. I'd wait for new papers, but time is a factor, you understand. It seemed better to hire a trader to act as a go-between. She leaned closer, her eyes shifting to the crowd around them. To be honest, there's some bad blood between the sellers and myself, too. It's also silly, really. Silly, but necessary. The kingdom of Huldre may have been as small as some of the baronies under Queen Lucia's thumb, but it was still its own sovereign nation. Slipping across the border between Huldre and Pierre Day would be complicated without the right papers. Delilah pulled a small pouch from under the table. She placed a single gold coin on the scarred table, wing side up. For the train fare, I can give you five more up front. The other half on delivery. Florencia picked up the coin. She counted the spots on the wings in the rigid lines. Pretending to consider the deal, Florencia turned the coin in her hand. Her fingers traced the grooved ridges along the thin side of the coin before examining the other side, which held the queen's crown. Forgery was a deadly game, but some people still played. The coin caught the light, a flash of gold. This monarch, at least, was real. Ten of them wouldn't replace what she had lost today, but it would be a good start. It also tipped Delilah's hand. Five monarchs was more than most people saw in a month. Ten? Ten was mighty desperate. That's a lot of money, Florencia said, pretending reluctance. Is the job dangerous? Delilah's hands fluttered again, graceful with a hint of impatience. No, it's only that the plant is rare, and I'm in a hurry. I'm already behind schedule as it is. Florencia didn't ask if the job was illegal. It most certainly was, and though she was curious as to what tales Delilah would spin, the day was wearing on. Time to pluck this errant dove. Eight now. Seven on delivery. Six and six, Delilah countered. We could spend all day arguing down to copper, Florencia said, placing the monarch on the table. Or we can cut to the chase and end on seven and seven. Deal, Delilah said, though she wasn't happy about it. Florencia eased back into her chair, a smile on her face. Well then, I think our stars align themselves nicely, don't you? Florencia sold her cart, fattening her purse further. She would need the speed more than the cart. She packed her meager supplies into her saddlebags before swinging smoothly onto her horse and heading inland to catch the train. She had memorized Delilah's instructions, burning the paper they had been written down on. She forked over half a crown for her train ticket to Veritas, grumbling over the extra buckeyes she had had to add to cover her horse's travel in the livestock car. The line to get on board was slow, since everyone had to show not only their tickets, but their papers. Florencia's happened to be fake, but her youngest son had made them, so she knew they had passed scrutiny. His forgeries were impeccable. On her way off the train, she had picked a man's pocket merely to make herself feel better and to make up for the money spent on tickets. She'd long ago graduated past such things, but liked to keep in practice. Her horse was galloping away down the muddy streets before the man even noticed his money was gone. Night descended, clouds gathered, and a cold, cutting rain fell, turning the road to ruin. Though the woods might offer cover, a hard winter and a cool spring made for desperate wolves and other things. Worse things. She powered through toward the manor. If she could sneak in during the cover of nightfall, all the better. Florencia thought she was dreaming when she spotted the golden magework bird roosting on the manor gates. When the bird's beak opened and the crisp voice of one of the staff issued out, offering a warm meal and a dry bed, she knew she had found the right place. The mage work was delicate and so exquisitely done that it looked real. Not a lot of people would be able to afford such a creation, but the kind of person who would have a flower worth 14 gold pieces would. Through the bird, the staff offered hospitality without having to slog down to the gates in the rain. Florencia had expected the offer. It wouldn't do to turn down a stranger. A weary traveler might be a godling in disguise. Florencia was fed, bathed, and tucked into an opulent guest quarters and a sprawling mansion set far back from the road. She met no one but the staff, who were faultless in their duties. After she was cared for, Florencia considered sneaking out to look for the flower, but decided to wait until morning. The evening was miserable. The manor lands appeared quite vast, and it would do her no good to get lost in the rain. In the morning, she found her trousers, shirt, and other clothing clean and pressed, smelling faintly of oranges. She put them on, feeling light with possibility. And if a few small, priceless objects found their way into her pockets, who was there to see? No one. The staff had left her to her business after breakfast. Once her horse was saddled, a groom gave directions back to the main road, coupled with a warning to stick to the path. She tipped her hat at him, amused by the blush that pinked his ears. 
Florencia kept her eyes to the sides of the path as she rode. Delilah had never given her the plant's name, but she had described it in detail, so Florencia dawdled, stopping frequently on any pretext to take a moment to search on the side of the path. As her horse clapped along, they passed orchards, topiaries, and brightly colored flowers she could not name, all things she had missed in last night's darkness and rain. She was entranced by their vivid pinks, yellows, and deep, vibrant reds. The road turned, and she saw a small shrub tucked away off the road, the first in a neat series of rows. Triumph bloomed in her. She urged her horse closer and inspected the flowers. Long, delicate white petals, freckled with a muted gray. The center and stamen were a gentle, blushing pink. She was no botanist, but even she could identify a flower if given enough detail. She didn't hesitate, but swung down, sliding her field knife from the leather sheath attached to her belt. Florencia cut away a small branch with three of the flowers, wrapping the stem on a dampened handkerchief she, as she had been instructed. Giddiness filled her, as it always did when a job was going well. Now, all she had to do was take the train back over the border and collect. Florencia turned to grab her horse, but never reached the reins. Metal brambles, their thorns thick and barbed, boiled from the forest floor, trapping her. Up they grew, tangling her in their grip until her feet left the ground. Her horse shied away from the magecraft, but not fast enough. The rain snagging on the briar, keeping the horse from bolting completely. There Florencia hung, bleeding, fuming, and cursing the magic that held her tight, when a roar cut through the forest. All bird chatter stopped. Insects quieted. Even the sun hid behind a cloud. She reached for her pistol, her fingers barely grazing the grip. Her knife lay on the grass under her, useless. Florencia's mind tried to make sense of the creature materializing from a copse of woods. Horns spiraled back from an angry brow. Eyes flashed. Fangs snarled. A scaled tail lashed, and a grinding voice of nightmares issued forth from its maw. How dare you take what's ours? Florencia trembled, the brambles digging deeper, and for the first time in her life, she knew real fear. You will pay, the creature snarled, with your life if need be. The creature moved then, all sinuous grace and predatory glide. I have no money, Florencia said. She had sewed her coins into her jacket lining this morning. It was unlikely the creature would find them. Florencia kept her words calm and even, even though her mind spun, looking for an out. There had never, not once, been a situation she couldn't spin, or a deal gone south that she couldn't talk her way out of. What you hold is more precious than money. You have taken my hospitality. You have seen my home. Do you think I need something as common as coin? A chuckle escaped the beast, low and mean. Only someone born to privilege could be so dismissive of such things. Florencia ignored the voice, the tail, the snarling teeth. Those would only frighten her, and she needed her wits. She looked into its eyes and calmed almost immediately. The beast may snarl and growl, but the eyes glittered with intelligence. She could reason with it. Florencia had spent her entire life fleecing those born to privilege. Whether the creature was hideous and horned didn't signify. Inside, the rich were all the same. I'm sure we can come to some sort of understanding. Perhaps, the beast said. I think our trade should be like for like, don't you think? You took several blooms, likely damaging the plant in the meantime. Blooms that could mean someone's life. The creature stalked closer to her now. She could feel its hot breath on the back of her neck. You want my life? Florencia asked. I'm not sure it would be worth the trade, the beast snarled. Cayenne's bloom is worth more than the life of a dishonorable thief. You're right, of course, Florencia said quickly. I'm hardly worth the trade. What use would I be? The beast stopped, eyes narrowing. It hadn't expected her quick agreement. Florencia licked her lips, the idea barely forming before she spoke it. I have nothing, am nothing. The only thing I have worth a bean is my son. The beast crept around her now, staring her in the face. You wish to trade your son for your freedom. Yes, Florencia said. As you've pointed out, I have no value. But Tevin, the light of my life, the jewel of the Dumont house, you will find no one more charming or handsome. He would cover my debt, I am certain. And so, Florencia Dumont sang the praises of Tevin to the beast, feeling no guilt whatsoever about trading away her oldest son. After all, it wouldn't be the first time. Wow, and that is the end to the prologue in chapter one of Cursed by Lish McBride. I'm enjoying that so far. It's obviously a Beauty and the Beast retelling. Again, gender bent. You've got the girl who was cursed to look like a beast although I do like the idea that you know it's still a different story it's its own story instead of her being like this selfish spoiled brat who you know that's the reason that she gets turned into a beast she's not wanting to marry this old sounds like kind of creepy dude I don't blame her um 
And yeah, I like the idea that, you know, you've got the mom with the son that are gonna end up representing, you know, the, the father inventor in Belle. They're also very much their own characters, it seems like. And I found that part of the end interesting. This isn't the first time that she's traded away her son. I wonder if she really feels like, oh, it'll be okay, I'll get Tevin back, it doesn't matter. Or if she's kind of careless about it and Tevin's gonna really find out that he needs someone to really love him for who he is just as much as the cursed girl will. I don't know. To find out more, you'll have to read it for yourself and I'll have to read it for myself. Let me get down in the comments what you thought of this reading. What do you think of this book so far? If you've read this book, what do you think of it? But please give a warning if you're going to include spoilers. And also let me know what are some other favorite Beauty and the Beast or other fairy tale retellings of yours because I'm really into this kind of thing. I love fairy tale retellings when they're done really well. Um, so yeah, on that note, happy reading. May you be inspired and I'll see you in my next video.